I'm speaking with Marty Cooper, who was with Motorola almost 30 years, ended up heading research and development and Motorola Mobility, and is the father of cellular. So, Marty, everything that everybody's complaining about cellular now today is your fault, yes? <laughs> well, there are a few people that are not complaining and a lot of people that are very dependent upon cell phones. So, uh, <laughs> you'll take I know that. you're just joking. Of course. So, could you, in your team, when you conceived of cellular and the concept and reuse of frequencies, could you ever have conceived of where this would go? Mark, we knew that someday everybody would have a, a phone. We used to tell a joke that, uh, that someday when you were born, you'd be assigned a phone number, and when you didn't answer the phone, you had died. But the one thing that we could not have predicted it was the smartphone, because we had uh, certainly uh, no digital cameras. The internet hadn't been invented yet. Yeah. There were no personal computers, so uh, and the integrated circuit had just been invented. So the idea that you could someday have a billion transistors in, in a handset, I mean, yeah, it get serious. You yeah. out of town. Uh, do you think at Bell Labs when they invented the Germanian transistor, they ever conceived where this was going? No, well, I don't think so, but uh, there were some of us that uh, uh, got the idea there, and, uh, and I think they knew that it was going to be important. When you, your team was designing cellular, did Motorola, did they agree or embrace your philosophy or did they, were they skeptical? Well, not only were they skeptical, Mark, but they were right. Because look what's happened to Motorola. The, the uh, really smart people on my management team, who were wonderful, by the way, they were supportive, uh, they were smart, but they worried about the fact that uh, their real skill of the old Motorola was they dealt directly with their customers. And now they were going to have somebody in between. They were going to have a carrier there. And they knew that that was going to be a problem. And sure enough, that is what happened. Mm -hmm. So there, there were a lot of skeptics. Do you think, uh, obviously the industry has gravitated. Apple has their own hardware manufacturing. Google bought Motorola. Uh, Microsoft bought Nokia. You, is this a good idea, bad idea, so you can control your entire ecosystem and there's no crossover, for example, between Apple and Android, obviously, and BlackBerry even. Is this, do you think this is the wave of the future or do you think there's going to be, it's going to back off and manufacturers are, it's going to go the other way? Well, I, I think we're going to find that uh, the, the uh, innovation is not going to stop. It's going to keep happening. It's very hard even for companies like Samsung uh, and uh, Apple to stay dominant. They don't do all their own manufacturing. They depend upon a lot of small manufacturers. And, and so uh, the world hasn't stopped changing. And, and if I was Apple and if I was Samsung, I'd be very nervous because there's always some guy hiding in the weeds and it's going to come in there and they're going to change things. So now these changes are slow. They're not going to happen in, in three or five, but maybe not 10 years. But uh, I promise you 20 years from now, the world's going to be very different than today. Well, the problem is everybody has a very short technological attention span. And what's a miracle today in 10 minutes has been integrated into your life. And what are you going to do for me next? And I think that, frankly, is Apple's problem to start with. It was Blackberries. And how do you top the iPad or the iPhone? It's all incremental now. And the public wants more iPhones and iPads. Well, it's only because, uh, believe it or not, after uh, 30 years, the cell phone business is still very immature. We're still growing up. Uh, the whole idea that the hardware is even important is kind of silly. What's important is how your life is changed mm -hmm. by the device, not by the hardware. And the thing that's going to happen over the next 20 and 30 years, you know, we've only been in cell phones for 30 yeah. years. In the next 30 years, it's the applications that are suddenly become, going to become very serious. 
They're going to revolutionize education. They're going to revolutionize health care. Social networking is going to grow up and it's going to be the way we do business. And those things are going to have enormous impact. They're going to make what we do today look trivial. Look at, look at the revolution in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, and how social media played a part in taking down Libya, Egypt. That was all social media. Yeah. Just imagine that concept, that idea of getting into our everyday life and how we run our corporations, how we run the government, and you're going to find that we're going to have orders of magnitude changes, and I hope orders of magnitude improvement in how we do things. So are we going to run out of spectrum? Everybody, especially the carriers, are screaming, we need to charge more because we only have a limited amount of spectrum, and this is insatiable demand. So where, where do we go with all of this technology? Well, the history is, and I, I've done some analysis, and there, uh, I uh, uh, evolved the, uh, what is called the, uh, 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 the law of spectral efficiency, which people want to call Cooper's Law. And for 110 years, we have doubled the throughput of our radio spectrum every two and a half years. We have cut the cost of putting stuff through the spectrum by half every three and a half years. So we're a trillion times more cost effective than we were when Marconi was putting bits through. And my belief is, and it's a belief that's based upon analysis of the technology, is that we can keep doing this for the foreseeable future, at least another 50 or 60 years. We can get more spectrally efficient and we can get the costs lower. And the, at the moment, we actually encourage the people that use the spectrum to use it inefficiently. If they use it inefficiently, they can come back and get more. And that's, that's really what I think the problem is. But there uh, has never been a shortage of spectrum. Somehow, technology has always come through. And, and any time anybody's had a new application, think about it. They find the spectrum for it. You want to watch movies? <laughs> oh, we'll find some spectrum. So there's always been the spectrum, and I think that's going to be true uh, for the foreseeable future, certainly in our, our lifetime. So you fly probably as much as I do. Why did it take the FAA so long to change the rules as far as using devices like iPads, Kindles, whatever, on board aircraft, when it was known for quite a while there was no interference problem? And I think, and Delta, Delta Airlines really led the research and the, the move to change the industry. I interviewed Delta's lead uh, person about this and I think in my view it all came to a head when they figured out the pilots were using iPads on the flight deck because the public all of a sudden realized this is all like nonsense. So why do you think it took so long? Is it you know, in the old analog days where you had a radio that put out six-tenths of a watt and you had a lot of frequency mix potential on airplanes, I could see the issue. But when everything went digital, what's the problem? Well, the problem has never been uh, technical. The problem's always been emotional. Even from the very beginning, when they first uh, had telephones and airplanes? Yeah. They, the telephones were put in by a private company, by GE at that time. Yeah, an air cell. And of course GE didn't want cell phones to work. And, and the Bureau of Standards did studies way back then. Right? Yeah, this is before cellular and demonstrated that they couldn't measure any interference mm -hmm. between the cell phones and these devices uh, and the uh, radio equipment. But there's always been the fear that perhaps that might happen, uh, and it's been emotional. And I think finally uh, the will of the people has come through, uh, except that we've got a situation now that I call the tyranny of the minority, where a few people are making a lot of noise about how uh, their people in the next seat are going to be screaming into their phones. I haven't seen anybody screaming into their phones lately, but that's what all of the, the uh, comments to blogs say. And I think that's uh, uh, foolish. Well, the reality is I've been using Skype. You know, Wi-Fi has been on board aircraft for several years now. Sure. And the bandwidth is enough that you can communicate. We use a two-way uh, radio over IP network. 
that all you need is a data connection and we use Skype and you know they don't even know you're using it and, and frankly the FCC hasn't prohibited that they prohibited cellular access from onboard aircraft and correct me if I'm wrong over about 5,000, 10,000 feet, your cellular radio won't work anyway. It, it, it will work intermittently and certainly yeah. not everywhere. So, uh, no, uh, uh, I think that uh, the solution to the, the best solution to the problem is to let the free market do it. Some of the airlines have said that their uh, customers don't want it. Well, we'll see. It's my view that, uh, if, that given a choice, uh, people will want to be able to talk at an absolute minimum if there is the capability of talking from the airplane and they don't permit at least emergency calls uh, I think it's a travesty and now we have to define emergency if, if you uh, <laughs> for, forgot something and you really need to talk to somebody and have them waiting at the airport here why shouldn't you be able to call that's not a, a, an intrusive kind of call the intrusive calls are people that talk real loud, and I, I was thinking of a subtitle for this article you're supposed to write. It's not the cell phone dummy, it's the people. How many times have you had uh, people sitting next to you or two seats away that are talking to each other in really loud voices in the most annoying way, and they're doing that without cell phones? So somehow or other, it's a question of, of uh, courtesy and rudeness. We have solved that problem. Do you, don't you remember when the cell phones first came out? Every time you went to movie theater, the phone would be ringing. Yeah. We've learned how to handle those things. We'll learn how to handle the cell phones on airplanes too. They haven't figured out how to handle screaming baby shit on airplanes. There, there you go. Uh, seems like uh, every other trip I take, there's a screaming baby. Yeah. Which would you rather have, a passenger talking on the phone or the screaming baby? Uh, that's a, uh, there's got to be a way to describe that choice, but the answer is neither one. Neither one. So, do you think, now, I mean, here's what I don't understand. Ten years ago, pre-9-11, we had phones on aircraft. It was called air cell. At every seat, there was a handset. Sure. And on all my transatlantic flights, or a lot of them, they're satellite phones. So, I don't understand what's changed. If everybody could make and did make phone calls then, even Verizon had a deal like 69 cents a minute, as I remember, it wasn't exorbitant. So I don't understand what the problem is if we had phones on aircraft at, aircraft at one point. No, I don't think that there, uh, that there is a problem. Uh, the uh, a number of the foreign airlines do have they do now. service today, and I haven't heard a single objection to those things. It, it really is not a manufactured problem. It doesn't really exist, nor do I think that it ever will. And from your engineering background, do you, you know, in Europe still, a lot of the airlines won't let you use your phone until the cabin door is open. And the American carriers, they do. Is there a safety pro a real safety problem? As far as I know, and I do keep track of the technology there is not an interference problem from uh, cell phones or most of the devices that we carry on uh, airplanes, computers. So people are being extra safe, right? Uh, and I'm not sure that that's a bad thing. So are we going to survive, Marty? Are we going to survive all this technology and all this improvement and all this wonderfulness in our lives that everybody thinks that are making our lives better? Not only are we going to survive, we are going to get better at accommodating it. Because of the computer and because of wireless, we are getting smarter every generation. We are solving all kinds of problems that we never even thought we could solve before. And that's going to keep growing exponentially. So we're getting more dependent on these things. And I may sound like an optimist, believe it or not, the world's becoming a better place. With technology. And technology is definitely uh, helping that happen. Certainly there are downsides, but the benefits from technology far, far uh, exceed the uh, potential dangers. The, the phones today, the iPhones, the Androids, which are really the two dominant platforms, where Windows will go nobody knows and Blackberry really nobody knows. 
Do you think these phones are really at their beginning stage as far as sophistication? What everybody thinks today is like the new iPhone 5S, you know, with the fingerprint reader, whatever. Is this in your world sophisticated or is this just the beginning? It's Number one, it's in its infancy. And number two, it's far from being sophisticated. What it is is far more complicated than it has to be. It, it is trying to turn us all into engineers when the definition of good technology is invisible technology. The technologies that are really good, they make our lives better and we don't have to do anything. With these modern cell phones, you know, I just I just got this, <coughs> this uh, Sony uh, wrist thing that was right. coupled to my cell phone through Bluetooth and it got set up by uh, near field technology. And I've had this for two days and I'm still... <laughs> so I... Uh, believe that the correct cell phone, and I'm going to disclose my invention to you for the first time publicly right now. When you buy a cell phone, that cell phone, should, before you set it up, should start asking you questions in English, not in technology. And when you answer those English questions, the cell phone should reconfigure itself to be your personal optimized telephone. And when that happens, everything that you do will be natural, it'll be the way you do it, it's going to be your phone. And until we have that, what we've got is a very complicated box that's a gadget. And do you like, I know you have an iPad, do you use Siri? No, I've obviously <laughs> tried it out, but it's a... It's a gimmick. It's a, it's a game, but I also point out to you that almost everything in the technology area starts out as games. Remember how we used to play Pong? Yeah. You're, you're, yeah, I, I think remember. You know, it was a mindless game. It only did one thing. It got us interacting with mm -hmm. a screen. And the next thing you know, we got really smart. They were playing Pac-Man. And then they start coming out with personal computers. We're already familiar with the manipulating things like the mouse. So uh, the Siri is... Uh, an early stage, but the fact is that I can talk to my Google Maps and yeah. tell the maps where I want to go, and for the most part I get there. So, it takes time. You made a comment to me uh, earlier about how the technology is changing on a daily basis. Sorry. For the really important things, it takes 20 years from the time something is introduced to the time that everybody's got one. So we're still in the early stages, but things are going to keep getting better. Last question. So how do you educate the public that really isn't technological? How do you educate the masses in how to use all these devices and how to make their lives better by using them? Well, it's going to have to be the professions. So the way I look at this and I look, uh, talk about the things that I understand, but education is a place that I think is just ripe for revolution. Because our kids now have access to all the information in the world. And, and then they have a, a teacher stands up in front of them and lectures them on a, a subject when uh, in a matter of seconds they can know more than the teacher. So somehow we are going to evolve an educational system that has the children playing games but we're going to fool them. Those games are all going to teach them and measure them. If you've played any modern games, you're, you're always being challenged. You're always trying to reach new levels. That's education. And the teachers are still going to be there, but they're going to have new roles. They're, they're going to relate the wisdom. They're going to teach the kids how to use these tools. And so we call that the flipped classroom. So where's that going to come from? There are always people in the profession that are leaders and little by little, they're going to do this. My daughter is a teacher now. They're already experimenting. The kids, kids meaning, in, in, in my stage of life, everybody is a kid. Right. Even you are. Yeah, thank so, you very much. Yeah. But, but the uh, teachers are, the young teachers are experimenting with these things. So that's what's going to happen in education. Healthcare is going to be absolutely revolutionized. You're, you're what we call a phone, which is kind of silly, right? Call this it's really a computer. Billion 
transistor yeah. device and call it a phone. It's going to become a server and deliver information about your entire body to a computer somewhere that already knows what your genome is and can predict what's going to happen to you before it happens. We are going to destroy disease. I'm just reading a book about that a doctor wrote about m m exactly that. The iPhone now has been approved by the FDA as to do EKGs, to do blood pressure monitoring, to do glucose monitoring, and you can email it all to your doctor. And this is really, you're right, it's going to be a revolution. Yeah, but it's going to happen. You know, we do a physical exam now. I get an annual physical every five years, whether I need it or not. Uh, you, with this new technology, you can have a physical exam every minute. Yeah, because you can send the results to your doctor. You bet. And, and, the, and the computers are going to be, the doctors are going to be interpreters, but the computers will be able to analyze this data much faster and present the doctor with, uh, with alternatives very rapidly. And are the processors, I was just speaking at a quantum computing conference in Canada, and they're telling me that the processors are going to be a thousand times faster yeah, well, there, we already have uh, uh, billion transistor processors operating at four gigabits per second, four gigahertz. Uh, that, that's incredible. That, that was a supercomputer. Yeah. Not many years. Oh, ago. it was Cray. That's and right. Moore's law hasn't stopped. It's going to keep <clears throat> growing. And the challenge is not the size of the processor; it's how we use them. So I'm back to my original thing. It's not the technology, dummy. It's the people. who... Uh, us accommodating the technology, that's where the challenge is. Marty Cooper, thanks very much. This has been a pleasure. Great pleasure.